Right. One thing we should keep in mind going through this, I know, uh, Daniel, you had recommended these lectures that people can uh, purchase that uh, I had already heard by uh, Robert Solomon. So he was one of uh, the guys that taught us at U Texas. With all these thinkers, he doesn't even really quote the text. He just gives the most sympathetic, the most useful to him interpretation of these guys that he can. And he analyzes this. Uh, yes, Kierkegaard is intensely devoted to his particular brand of Christianity, the Lutheranism of his time. But Solomon at least claims that you could take the personal approach and the invitation to take the leap of commitment really for any religion. And he talks, uh, Solomon talks a bit about Buddhists going through something that's very comparable to this. So I'm not sure how well that applies to this particular discussion. Like for me, the fact that it was ultimately going to end up with be you have to submit to God and realize that that's the key part of yourself that you have to acknowledge it really ruined quite a lot of it for me. <laughs> but I will try to uh, take that open-mindedness. I don't think you need to view the sickness unto death as this whole build-up to one punchline at the end saying, and if you don't give up everything to God, then all is lost. I mean, first of all, keep in mind the tone of the book was written by this pseudonym, Anticlimachus or Anticlimachus. With the idea that this was from a perspective that was so Christian that even Kierkegaard couldn't meet it. That's why he chose that name. So I think we should take what's being said here seriously, but I think there's a lot of value to be taken and that Kierkegaard isn't necessarily saying your only solution out of this is to just kind of put unalloyed faith in God and just constantly relate yourself to God and try and do this. I think the real point is kind of hidden in the middle, which is, look, a lot of people just live their lives without even going through this process. A lot of people are simply just far too satisfied thinking they're Christians thinking they have their act together and not coming to terms with the choices they have to make in life, right? One could completely look at this as just a critique of mass society, of kind of comfortable bourgeois mentality, of making oneself a number. And what he's trying to say is, no, you need to relate yourself to these concepts, whether it be relating yourself to God or just kind of reflecting upon your own choices and how you're going to comport. And again, the self relating to itself, how you're going to comport your interiority with your exteriority, right? So I think I once heard Solomon saying, look, to some degree, what Heidegger thinks you need to do is you need to just construct a project for yourself, right? And that's a way that I think you can tie in a lot of what Kierkegaard has to say without having to get hung up on the God solution. You've got a limited amount of time. This is resolving your finitude and your infinitude. A lot of people just kind of float from blip to blip to blip without realizing their life is this one continuous process. And you need to come to grips with the choices you make in life in order to develop your own understanding of who you are. Yeah, and, and there may be a way to, as well, to cash out the idea of submission to God, let's say, in the end, in more secular terms, right? Because in the in the beginning, he talks about it as there being this power that has established a self-relation and resting transparently in that as a way of fully being oneself, we could say being authentic. So despite the particular Christian trappings of this, or even theological trappings, the extent to which it needs those is unclear to me. I mean, of course, Kierkegaard certainly thought that Christianity was the one religion that bridges the finite and the infinite, you know, via someone who's both God and man and so on. But again, I think we can get secular versions of these notions, including of the notion of, of, a, of the idea of submission to God or to some greater being, let's say. It's funny that how somewhat atypically I'm taking, I'm actually reading this like a work of metaphysics, you know, and I'm sort of like, oh, well, you have this relation that exists in this impossible place between you know, the infinite and the finite, and there's no way to comprehend that reasonably. There's no way to understand how that's even possible except through God. And so that's what leads Sounds to... Sounds like the Heideggerian influence here. Right. And it's not just through God. It's through embracing the absurd, which is really what yes. religious right. faith comes down to for him, that it's this personal relationship where you really can't do analyses. You can't do analyses of theological things. And, and a lot of, again, the stuff about Christian intellectualism that he was objecting to, like trying to make miracles sound plausible or trying to give sensible explanations for how Jesus could be both a God and a man or how we could both be spirit and flesh. Like, no, these are just fundamental paradoxes that are supposed to kind of drive us to this kind of enlightenment. Yeah, well, no, I, the reason I said that it's funny is because if Daniel wasn't on this podcast, I would probably be talking more like him and Wes would be talking more like me. <laughs> But this is what I'm trying to say, Mark, is that take everything else out of the equation from a purely philosophical perspective, or at least from just interpreting this one particular text. It's fascinating that I now come to understand that Kierkegaard's notion of the self is that 
The self is itself one of the fundamental paradoxes that you just described, and that you have to understand yourself as only being possible as an absurdity or in the face of the absurd, just like spirit and flesh and, and those sorts of things. And that's why you need God. But that in itself is a fascinating concept that the self is maybe the paradox. And that's interesting and new and unusual. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to say that it's not a thing, not trying to get at, you know, his solution. The other part of it is that it's not just that it's a paradox, it's that it's a dynamic paradox. And that that's what brings in the Hegelian dialectic aspect that to be yourself, you have to engage in dialogue, as it were, between all the different things that you're sort of stuck between and between yourself and the fact that you are this type of thing, not just the sorts of things like society versus your individual will, possibility and necessity, but also the fact that you are this type of thing. You have to engage dialectically with that. And because it's dialectic and there's no finite static end that you're going to drive to like you would in a Hegelian model. That's right. And I think he says it's that it's so difficult that most people just don't bother. Yeah, first you have to realize it. You have to start. What is it? Acknowledging it is the first step. Kierkegaard's 12-step well, program. it's a three-step yeah, exactly. program, right? But, you know, which is, because, the, you know, I mean, is that the, ex the way the existentialists get off drugs? <laughs> Just step three program. steps. Actually, maybe we can write a self-help book based on that. Well, this. I mean, I'd like to think that The Sickness Unto Death is intended, either ironically or sincerely, as a kind of self-help book, right? I mean, he, the whole introduction to the book is, look, hmm. this is a kind of sickness of the spirit. And I am going to be the doctor who attempts to cure you. And just as a doctor is only going to explain the sickness to you in lay terms, because the doctor understands that you're not going to get the whole science of physiology. So he's only going to explain it as much as you, the patient, need to understand it. Kierkegaard, or Anticlimachus, is, is basically saying, look, I'm only going to try to explain this in terms that you can understand it, but I am doing this so that you can try to be cured of this. Because he never at one point says that despair is so invisible that it's not a problem. His point when he says people have despair and don't know it, it's not that they don't experience the symptoms of despair, which is this kind of very banal, this very kind of cliched sense that everyone I think has at one or more points in their lives of. All of this seems so utterly pointless and meaningless. And he's trying to get you to understand how it is that it comes to pass that you feel this and that the only way you're going to break out of that sense of kind of hopelessness and futility at this crazy world in which we live is to go through this process. Now, ultimately, he's got a solution saying, ultimately, you kind of have to go with faith in God, right? And I think that's important. I mean, this is one of the key things yeah. that I think to get maybe swing it a little bit back toward his Christian message, which is that despair is a sin. It has these symptoms when you feel it, but ultimately, it's a sickness that you do to yourself by either not thinking about it, or once you think about it, you're not willing to come to terms with it, or once you do come to terms with it, you ultimately just reject it as all nonsense. But if you're willing to go through all of those stages, you'll ultimately break through. Now, any number of different people, Sartre's probably the obvious one, found ways to secularize that solution. Ultimately, Sartre kind of elevates freedom to this ultimate point, that the ability to choose above all else is something that you have to kind of commit to, and that will give your life meaning and kind of cure you of the despair of pointlessness. And to some degree, you guys touched on this on your Camus episode too, right? that ultimately the only way you can kind of break out of this uh, suicidal sense of meaninglessness is to just construct a meaning for yourself through choice. I think you said that despair is a sin. I think he actually says that despair is sin. Good point. And so this is a way you can kind of metaphorically, I guess, tie this into the concept of man being born into original sin. You know, you're born into this state of despair, whether you're aware of it or not, and then you have to spend kind of your whole life trying to claw back out of it, so to speak. But you brought up the concept of freedom, too. It's not just freedom, right? It's freedom from despair, which would theoretically be what? Oh, well, I didn't mean to say freedom from despair. Kierkegaard wouldn't say that freedom is the opposite of despair. He would say that despair is sin and that the opposite of sin is faith, right? Now, most people at the time, and probably today, would say that the opposite of sin is virtue. But he's saying, no, sin is not something you commit. You know, most people think of a sin as murder, theft. An act. Yeah, acts that one commits. Whereas he's saying, no, it's a state of existence, right? It's a kind of a mindset. It's a right. sort of defiance of a command of comportment that God puts upon you. I don't think he would say that freedom is a cure for despair. I would say that there are other thinkers since Kierkegaard who have tried to replace God you know, replace faith in God with something else. And ultimately a commitment to, you know, using freedom as a commitment to your own ability to build yourself up and to make your own choices and to own your own life. It seemed to me at least the start solution. Now, I don't know if, are we already breaking some of the ultimate axioms of the show here that we're not going to be name dropping or is it okay? Cause you guys you have covered are. a lot of this already. 
Okay. You're fine. <laughs> we should give some of the concrete examples. A lot of the middle of this essay is taken up by this psychology, really. And it's kind of a phenomenological psychology. It's like, here's my, the results of my introspection and my looking at other people. And here are problems that people can run into in this dialectical obstacle course of becoming what you truly are. So we talked about the finitude versus infinitude. And, you know, how could we be stretched between those? Well, he, he describes for each of these kind of things. And I, I wrote down like eight kinds of despair before I just stopped. <laughs> but there's more than that. Is that from your own personal experience, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> so if you, you know, focus on the infinite aspect of our nature and forget about the finite, then it's like you're living in a fantasy world. In fact, I don't think he would do just an analysis of the mind-body problem sort of considered an abstraction. What he considers the mind-body problem I'm sure this is what you meant, Seth, is, you know, the embodiment in the world of action, right? So this, the mind-body problem is very much tied to what you think versus what you do. And so if you're just hanging out and introspecting all the time and just think that the world of possibilities is for you, I see this is something I'm definitely guilty of, that, you know, you need to realize your embodiment as well and thereby transmit all this thought into action. The second example, being obsessed, be ignoring the infinite aspect of ourselves is just being very narrow-minded. This is my job. This is what I do. This is my routine. These are my interests. I'm not interested in hearing anything about philosophy or other things. You know, that's the other side. The first version that I described, I think, very well describes most philosophers and certainly Kierkegaard himself as too stretched up in their own thoughts. Really, in some ways, Kierkegaard is the chief antagonist to this partially examined life thing that I was one of the foundational ideas of having this podcast and my attitude toward philosophy that like, if you just do it all the time and let it consume you, that that's kind of unhealthy. You really should, as you were saying, some of these existentialists do say, take a project and throw yourself into that rather than just constantly introspecting. And, you know, if you're just sick in a secretions of your own thought, and that can get to the extent that you don't actually really accomplish very much at all. Probably we all know people like this or are people like this if you're listening to this. <laughs> well, we've mentioned this um, this idea of becoming something, an authentic, we've dropped the authentic. Obviously, if the self is, like you say, Mark, liable to all these different types of despair and the state of the self is despair, we said that Kierkegaard has a solution and suggests a solution for how to get out of despair or at least deal with it and reconcile yourself to it in some way. But that solution is, he mentions, becoming your true self. And whether that's a metaphysical state or a something that's more almost psychological, this idea that you might be something that you're not is part of what he plays on in that first third of the book. And I think what he means there is, like, say, for example, you really you don't feel like you're a real social person, or maybe you have a certain set of friends you want to spend time with and family and what have you. But you work at some kind of a firm that has lots of social functions that require you to show up and put on a brave face and smile and glad hand and all that sort of thing. And you do it, but you really don't feel like that's you. And you really don't feel like if you were dictating the course of your own life and all that, that you would spend your time doing that as opposed to whatever else you'd rather be doing. Like maybe you want to brew beer, but you're a marketing executive. And at least that's part of the sense that I got, that you're caught in this tension between something that you aspire to or something that you want to do and something that, say, societal pressures might be encouraging you to do. Just in the service of utterly agreeing with you on that, I wanted to use that as a section for one of my favorite quotes from the whole book, where he says here, Such things cause little stir in the world. For in the world itself is what one least asks after, and the thing it is most dangerous of all to show to signs of having. The biggest danger, that of losing oneself, can pass off in the world as quietly as if it were nothing. Every other loss, an arm, a leg, five dollars, a wife, etc., is bound to be noticed. I just thought it was a really kind of poetic way, which, by the way, kind of acts in stark contrast to some of the tedious writing in, in other sections of the book. really kind of encapsulates what you were saying there, that society really doesn't encourage you to think about what it is you want to do and, and how to direct your own life. Yeah, and we're not taught to either be aware of or value the self as much as we're taught to be aware of and value other things, which is which is kind of like an upending of what he thinks the right focus should be. And that makes, I don't know, I, I agree with that point at least. 